Lost Boys is a book about um, underage boys from Australia and New Zealand in the First World War. Now, what do we mean by underage? At the beginning of the war in 1914, the Australian government would allow you to go to war at the age of 21 without parental permission. Uh, but it would also let you go at the age of 19 with parental permission. So uh, you had to have a form signed by your parents if you were under 21. Um, in practice, that meant 18-year-olds were underage, but later in the war, they became of age. So it's kind of complicated. Um, in the Second World War, for instance, you could go at the age of 20 without parental permission. Uh, and then that dropped by mid-1943 to 18 as well. But in fact, for the purposes of the book, I was looking at kids who were much younger than that. Um, and in the book, you will find stories of 14 and 15 year olds. And the youngest that I found was 13 and eight months on enlistment. Uh, and we'll get to him. Um, I just want to say a few words about the sort of governing ideas of the book before I go on. Um, it's not a um, conventional narrative history. Uh, it's more like an unconventional history and a very personal one. Um, my aim was not to create more uh, recruits. If anything, it was probably to create more conscientious objectors. Because, so this is not a military book. It's not an anti-military book either. I, mean, I have a great respect for soldiers in general and what they do. But um, this much of military history is kind of about certain words like sacrifice. And you won't find those words in this in the way I describe um, what happened over there. Because I think those words are kind of like a, they're like a Band-Aid on, on what happened. We can talk about that a bit later if you want. The First World War is an incredibly interesting conflict, if you um, have ever, ever looked at it. Some people become obsessed with it, and I would probably say I'm a little bit one of those. Some people could become obsessed about other wars, but the First World War in particular is the one that has interested me for most of my life. But it's a crowded field if you're going to write a book about it. There, you know, virtually every thing you could think of um, has been written about in terms of World War I. Which is why it surprised me when I came up with this idea because um, I, didn't ex I, mean, there are the I didn't expect um, to find... I was looking for something, but I didn't expect to find such a, an idea as this. And it is a, it's a very strong idea for a book publisher because of course, it has a great emotional... Paul and so on, um, and so I've been very fortunate with my with m my dealings with publishers. Um, but why write it? The, the the point I guess for me was to try and find a story that hadn't been told, and to try and do it in a way that hadn't been done very much. And so that's why this is a very personal book. It's a very personal narrative. It looks like a, a string of of chapters, each one about a different boy, which is true. That's more or less what it is. It's also a kind of a backdoor history of the First World War for people who don't know anything about the First World War. So if you're, and I wrote it with the idea of a 15 or 16 year old boy or girl in mind who was curious and didn't know anything. So it will take you from the start of the war to the end of the war. And it will take you through most of the engagements that the Australian and New Zealand soldiers were involved in, more of the Australians than the New Zealanders, that's true. Um, so it's a kind of a backdoor way of telling uh, the history of, of the First World War. Let's have a look at this soldier. Anybody see anything unusual about that soldier? Speak up. Lost a hand. No, hasn't lost a hand. There are two hands there, you just can't see them. Uniform is a, Uniform is a bit big and that's actually not unusual. Um, that's pretty, pretty normal for the, for the time. This was 1915. Anything else? He looks about 10. He does look about 10. Look harder. It's a female. Well spotted. This is Maud Butler. She came from Curry Curry. She was a girl. Uh, and she, uh, her brother had enlisted. She was a plucky kind of girl, uh, obviously, because she got herself, she, she went to the Red Cross and said, I want to go to the war. And they said, well, are you a nurse? And she said, no. And they said, well, come back when you're a nurse. Um, and so she went to Sydney. She got a job in a pub. Uh, she met soldiers. She bought the tunic coat, the, the um, 
the, the puttees around the legs, the, the whole uniform, bit by bit, and put it together so that, um, so that she could get herself into uniform. Uh, she went to um, the barber, got her hair cut off. She went to the Woolloomooloo docks when she when knew a ship was leaving with troops, waited until the, um, the uh, wharf guards had their backs turned. And depending on who you read about her, she either shimmied up a rope or she walked onto the, to the ship um, uh, when they weren't looking. Uh, but of course she got found, and she got into a, into a, a boat and, and was found. The next day she got it, came out of the, the lifeboat and was mixing with the other soldiers when an officer noticed that she hadn't got the right shoes and asked her about the shoes and that it, there was something a bit more obviously uh, wrong with her, her being there and that was um, uh, the fact that she was a girl. They put her on a ship, <laughs> this is the funny part to me, they put her on a ship going back to Sydney but they transferred her from the, one, from the troop ship to the other ship across one of those pulley lines. Uh, completely and utterly dangerous way of you know, getting her back to port basically putting her life in her hands. So she, she wanted a, a, some, um, some adventure, then uh, she certainly <laughs> she had it after about a day. Um, she was extremely determined and uh, she did it again. So this woman um, has, a, has a, a very peculiar place in the history of, of the Australian soldiers in the First World War because she stowed away not once but twice. The second time she got as far as Melbourne. The newspapers, of course, loved her. And this photograph was taken by one of the other soldiers on the, um, on the ship. I did a talk about the, this book in um, this year, in February, I think it was, um, at uh, the War Memorial in Canberra. And when I asked that question, does anybody th see anything unusual? But there's a hand shot in front of me here and said, yeah, she's a woman, she was my grandmother. So um, I got to meet her, her granddaughter, who told me a bit more about her story. She came. She didn't get to the war. She came back. She she got married. She had a large family. She had a very active life. She was quite an activist around this area in later life. But an interesting story. She wasn't the only stowaway. Um, this is John Smith and Frank Day in 19, early 1916, here in Newcastle. A Colonel W. C. Markwell told the crowd about finding a boy of 11 years of age in his, on his ship when he was uh, coming out of Perth. And this boy wanted to stay on and he cried when he, was, when he sent him off. He'd, he'd been several months training with the troops. They tried to smuggle him back in a carpet the next day and they found him again and sent, sent him off, sent him home. Now, I don't know that that boy was, was this Frank Day, but I think it might have been. These two boys were uh, featured in the, in the newspapers in Melbourne when they were sent back from, because they both got as far as Egypt. And the boy on the, the, sm the small one on the right, on the left, is, um, was 11 years old when he, when he stowed away. The reason I'm dwelling on these stowaways is because it shows you the sense of determination that the young had, that the underage had to get to the war. And one of the purposes of the book was to try and work out why young men, young boys, wanted to go. That involved me in a kind of a, a voyage of discovery about trying to think as if I was living in 1914 rather than judging you know, from 100 years distance. And one of the things that you can very truly say about this period is that, that the idea of being young was different to the, to the way it is now. Most uh, children, you had a kind of an idea of child, childhood until the age of about 12, and then you were a young adult. Because at the age of 12 to 14, depending on how lucky you were, you left school. Very few people went beyond 14. By the age of 15, some of these boys had been in the workforce for three years. They didn't think of themselves as children. They didn't look like children. They couldn't vote, and they couldn't get married, but they could do most everything else. And so, they didn't think of themselves as children, and nor did the society think of them as children. That's one of the key things to understand in the idea of how did this happen and who let them go. It's still hard to explain, but that was one of the key, the key differences between now and then. The word teenage, teenager didn't exist. It's a 1950s word that we imported from, from, from the US, and it's really a marketing concept. So there was no teenage you know, years. There were... There were the childhood, childish years, 
And then you were a young, a youth, uh, a young person. And these kids were considered plucky. The newspapers loved their stories about underage kids. I found almost no, in months and months of looking through the coverage of, these, of this topic, I, didn't, I think I found no actual examples of condemnation of the idea of sending underage um, boys to war. Nor is there anything in Hansard uh, about, about this topic. No one discussed it. No one thought it was even remarkable. Of course, there was a tradition of young people in, um, in arms in the 19th century. There was a long tradition in the, in the British Navy. And of course, it, that tradition carried over to the Australian Navy, which had recently been formed. So there were different concepts of how old you had to be to, to be able to fight for your country. There were also backdoor rules that said, for instance, if you were a bugler and you were underage, you could be admitted to the armed forces in exceptional circumstances. So that was a, that was a little known exception that, that many youngsters um, uh, were able to, to ex they didn't even know they played the bugle until they were told you'll be a bugler, um, oftentimes. They weren't particularly necessarily musically uh, adept. So there was a mad rush to join up in, the, in early 1914, in, in August 1914, when the war was declared. And of course, you had to meet minimum standards, supposedly. But there had to be a huge amount of connivance by the army and by the army's appointed doctors to allow this to happen. This is a recruiting picture from, I think, 1916. Um, I've, since the book was published, uh, that, person, that doctor's name has been given to me, um, so we know who he is. But you can see along that line of men there, which one of those would you think would be underage? Right? Number one, terribly, terribly um, uh, proud to be going, doesn't look like he's underage, he's probably 30. The one behind him, not sure. The really tall bloke, probably not, probably overage. It's so, it's very difficult to tell who's underage and who isn't, especially if you don't really want to know. And the army didn't really want to, want to know. You didn't have to have a birth certificate. Very few people had birth certificates in 1914. You didn't even have to know your birth date. When you signed the accreditation form, they said, how old are you, son? I'm 19 years and three months, sir. They didn't ask, oh yeah, what year, what year and what month and what day were you born? That would have been the quickest way to weed out a lot of these boys, right? Many of them were turned away. I'm not giving the impression, I don't want to give the impression that it was an easy walk in. Many of them were turned away. The real mystery to me was why any of them were, were at this stage were taken. Because the army was flooded with fit men who wanted to go to war. They turned away fully one third of those who were of a proper age. So they didn't need to take underage kids. They could have just filled the ranks of the first 20,000, which is what they promised, from, from 10,000 in Sydney and 10,000 in Melbourne, who came in the first week of recruitment in both of those cities. Forget about the, country, the countryside. They could have just filled it from Sydney and Melbourne, from able-bodied men of the proper age. They didn't. They, from the beginning, they allowed underage boys to, to get in. And that's a, that's a mystery that I'm, I'm not sure I ever got to the bottom of. This is where they were heading, of course. This is Gallipoli. This is a New Zealand picture, which you don't see too often in Australian publications. But it's a very busy picture, and it shows you the landing site at, um, at Gallipoli, probably maybe a week after the landing, so probably around the 1st of May, somewhere around there. You can see that the pontoons have been are being built. You can see that, that um, uh, there are some, you know, little wharves have been pushed along. There, there are roads up being, being pushed through. Um, this is, of course, where Australia and New Zealand first went into, into action in, uh, in the First World War. We don't know how many underage boys were, there were on Gallipoli, but I suspect it was more like in the thousands than in the hundreds. One of the points that things I can't get to the bottom of in, in this is how many underage boys there were in the First World War in the Australian, uh, in the Australian and New Zealand forces. I, th I am absolutely certain it was in the thousands. Um, there are 171 names on the Australian honour roll, which is the list of war dead, who they, we know were underage in the First World War. Of the 60,000 men who died from Australia in that war, 
there's 171 we can prove that they were underage. The difficulty, of course, is they all lied to get in. Right? So their records make it very difficult for, to work out. You have to get a firm birth date. You know, and that is sometimes difficult. Some of these boys that I was chasing for two years didn't have um, a firm birth date registered anywhere. And I'll tell you one of the stories about it them later. This, um, I told you that the youngest man, that in, the youngest boy to enlist was 13 years and eight, eight months. Uh, that's him on the left in 1927. That's a Sydney Morning Herald photograph from uh, when he was going up to, um, uh, Pup, to Papua New, New Guinea. Um, he, um, his name was Leslie Shaw. And in September of 1914, he was 13 years and eight months and his parents had just been through a horrible divorce. He was living in London. They had been, uh, he, they put him into a boarding school there. The family was split asunder. His mother had taken the, his sister. His, the father took, took Leslie. I think he was probably extremely unhappy um, at that time. And it, his father pulled strings. We know that to get him into a New Zealand force that was being, that was being put together in, in uh, London. Ra rather than send these hundreds and hundreds of New Zealanders who wanted to fight back to New Zealand for training, they put together a unit in, in London, opera singers, architects, lawyers, um, artists, uh, you know, um, all sorts of professional people who were living in London, many men who were visiting London on holiday and went straight to their, to their High Commission and said, you know, sign me up, and 13-year-old Leslie Shaw. Um, he was in uniform uh, uh, very quickly, and he had um, a fairly interesting war. Um, his, uh, he fought at Gallipoli in the New Zealand Field, field Engineers. Um, he got sick, and he was there until August, and he got sick. He was sent home back to England to recuperate. He was still only 15 years of age then. He re rejoined the New Zealand Division in January 1917 in Flanders. Three days later, he was admitted to hospital with mumps. Probably saved his life. He went uh, back into the line, th uh, survived Messine, the Battle of Messine in 1917, and the big one, Passchendaele. Um, whereupon, his mother got him out. Now, since 94, that's nearly three years. I, I don't know, did she not know that, her, that her, her only son had been in the New Zealand Army for three years? I don't know. Clearly, I couldn't, I couldn't find any, tr any trace of her, but um, she did finally write to the, uh, to the authorities and say, this boy is underage and I don't want him to, to continue in the, in the armed forces. So he went back, to, he was sent back to London, and in May 1918, he joined the Royal Air Force. Uh, he's still underage at this point, uh, and he was commissioned as a um, pilot, sent to France, and then the war ended. Uh, so he never actually fought in anger, although later in life he told people he shot down five planes. Um, he became a tea planter in India. He rejoined the RAF in 1923. In 1928, he was in Papua, in the busiest corridor in the world, flying heavy machinery and gold in and out of Wau and Bololo on the, in the New Guinea gold fields, along with Errol Flynn, as many of you all know. 